considered hosting a um, Christmas Eve service. And um, I always just let it get past me and they think about next year, next year. And this year I was really impressed about a family tradition. And since we are a family, a church family, this would be a wonderful tradition to start keeping is a Christmas Eve service. And so we'll meet here, listen, we're going we're gonna to come in about six, we're going to sing a few Christmas carols, we'll have a short teaching, it'll be an opportunity for you to bring your family members, it's going to be a family service, no children's ministry, they're going to be in here with us, praise the Lord, and, uh, and just a time to just uh, make a memory. And so we're inviting you to come out, bring your family and friends for that service. It'll be an enjoyable time. With that said, let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. And let me explain it like this. For those of you who don't know what the book of Acts is all about, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are a historical record of the life of Jesus. It follows the footsteps of Jesus as he came and he lived, and he did ministry, and he sacrificed as man and as God. And it's a beautiful picture. His teachings, everything there. Well, the book of Acts is also historical record. The historical record of how the Holy Spirit and Jesus built the church. And how the church came to be. The church didn't start with a religion. The church started with a group of people who believed in Jesus Christ and got together and, 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 and spread the message of Jesus Christ throughout their world. And that's the, what the book of Acts is about. So how the church came to be, how it got its, its traction, and how it's traveled 2,000 years all the way to us. Isn't that amazing, guys? And here's the awesome thing, is that the book of Acts is the only book of the Bible without a closing statement of amen. And that's because the book of Acts, the church, is still moving and still going. You are a part of that work that Jesus Christ is building and a part of the Holy Spirit and what he's doing in this world. Every single one of us coming together are part of it. And so it's a beautiful story. And so we've been going through chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through this historical record of the church gaining influence. And what we've learned about is, is the, the one main character that we've talked about here recently is the Apostle Paul. Say his name out loud. Who? Paul. Paul. The Apostle Paul. And you know, the Apostle Paul covered city after city. After he became a Christian, because he had been persecuting the church, he was a religious fanatic that was fighting against the church, a, a Jewish religious fanatic, fighting against the church, and he finally came to a place where he became a believer in Jesus Christ, and his whole life changed. Not only did he stop persecuting the church, but he also began to propagate and started pushing and, and elevating the church. And he began to travel as he did, uh, he began to travel and share the gospel with other people who had never heard it, heard the gospel of Jesus. And people began to believe, and churches began to evolve and erupt out of his preaching in the different places that he preached. In fact, thousands of Gentiles had become Christian, and multiple churches had begun to blossom because of the Apostle Paul. And here's what we know. Uh, uh, the Apostle Paul was from Jerusalem. That's where he got saved. It was on his road to Damascus, uh, Syria, that he ended up um, encountering Christ, and he became a believer. Uh, several years later, he ended up becoming a preacher of the gospel of Jesus. He became so inspired and so turned on to, to the Lord that he wanted to spread that good news. So he came to Syria and he started a church. He preached the gospel in Antioch and a church was started. And he came over to Derbe and to Lystra. And he preached the gospel there and to Iconium. And, and churches started in those areas as believers were, were, were coming. Then he went over to Antioch and preached the gospel there and a church started. And then he went over to Troas. A church developed there. He went over to Philippi and preached the gospel there. And in Thessalonica and Berea, preaching to just whoever would listen and churches began there and then he went down to Corinth and he preached the gospel at Corinth one of the most sin soaked cities of the entire world the Las Vegas of the of the of the, of the, of the east there and, and people believed in Christ and a church started in Corinth and then he came over to 
Ephesus. And in Ephesus, Ephesus was the most demonic city with the biggest cult that ever existed in the world at the time. And he preached the gospel there. And the biggest church ever erupted in Ephesus. Everywhere he went, he was preaching the gospel. And, and, and guys, we, we've covered that, his, his journey. Um, but what was going on is while he was having so much success, the mother church back in Jerusalem was suffering. Uh, persecution, drought, and famine was choking that church out. And the original disciples that were there, Peter, James, and John, they just couldn't keep the church floating. And so Paul decided that he wanted to help. Everybody say help. That, that, that's a good thing. Paul, you know, rallied the Gentile churches that he had started, and he, had, he, he rallied them to gather an offering for the church in Jerusalem. He said, listen, that's where it started. That's where Jesus, was, you know, he came. His ministry was there. The gospel first started there, and so I want to help this church. So he told all those churches to gather what they could so they could take it to Jerusalem. And, and you see, Paul had a, a reason, another motive for doing this, not just because he wanted to help, but because the church in Jerusalem had always looked at the, had looked at the Gentiles, Christians, with suspicion and doubt and, and a little bit of prejudice. Like, you know, they, I don't, we don't know if we should trust them. Uh, I don't know, you know, they're not really our, uh, I don't know if they're fully Christians. Because, uh, you know, it started here. So they always had a little bit of prejudice. So Paul thought, that by bringing an offering and helping them, coming to the rescue, that it might change that church in Jerusalem's perspective and hopefully change the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles and the Christianity. And so Paul said, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to take this offering to them and, and hopefully it will, it will open their eyes and they'll, 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 they'll understand that we're just like Christ as much as they are. And so during Paul's visit to the Gentile churches to collect the offerings, because he went to every single one, he encountered a lot of old friends there, people who he had led to Jesus years earlier. And, uh, you know, as they were, you know, catching up and talking and connect, reconnecting, a lot of his friends told Paul, Paul, I don't think it's a good idea for you to go to Jerusalem. They had their apprehensions. Um, you know, uh, not about helping the Jerusalem church, but about Paul going back to Jerusalem. They, 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 would, they told Paul something like, it doesn't take Nostradamus to tell you that it, it's a bad idea to go over there, Paul. I mean, you barely got out alive the last time you were there. Nine years ago, both the Christians and the Jews in Jerusalem wanted you dead. You barely escaped. So I don't think it's a good idea that you go back there. Well, you know what Paul told them? Paul stood in front of them and he said, Saiske. <laughs> well, maybe he didn't say that. But he said this. Everybody say that along with me. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Say it again. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Kind of like the lady whose controlling husband would always try to keep her from going to church. One Sunday, he got so livid, he pulled out a gun and pointed it at her, and he said, where do you think you're going? Without hesitation, she said, if you pull the trigger, I'm going to heaven, and if you don't, I'm going to church. <laughs> that was Paul's attitude. Yeah, there's trouble ahead, but I've got to finish my course. Listen, Christian life will always have spiritual battles and storms. Christian life will always have temptations and trials and troubles. It will always have fears and foes and friction. In fact, Jesus warned us about it. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, let's read the words of Jesus. Here's what he said. Read it with me. In, these, in this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties, difficult times. How many of you have experienced as Christians difficult times? Huh? Yeah, look at, look at their hands. And if those who didn't raise their hand, they're just too lazy to raise it. Because we all go through it, don't we? It's part of it. Jesus said it. Peter also echoed this, 1 Peter chapter 4. He said, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through. 
as if something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised. Everyone goes through trials, difficulties, troubles, temptations. Everybody faces foes and, 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 and fights, uh, spiritual battles. Everybody does. And guys, just like natural storms happen, so do spiritual storms. Now that's, that's the takeaway. But Paul knew better than to let the fear or worry of impending storms keep him from God's work. And, you know, the fact of the matter is we're all going to go through them. We're all going to face them. We're all going to be in the middle of them. And so whether you're in a storm right now or not, but if you're not, you're thinking, well, listen, Paul was in this, this position. They're talking about the storm that's looming, the storm that's ahead. And he's like, well, you know what? I, you know, I can't worry about that. I, I, I'm not going to let that keep me from doing the work that I need to do. In fact, Paul stood in front of them and said, none of those things move me. Say it out loud. None of those things move me. When they're telling him about the storms that were ahead, the things that he might encounter, he said, the chains, the persecution, the uh, you know, prison, he said, none of those things move me. He said, I want to finish my race with joy and not regret. Amen. You guys got that? I want to finish my race with joy. I don't want to look back and think, I, man, I, I, I let the storm or the impending doom or the fact that it was coming keep me from doing what I should do. He said, I didn't want to do that. Paul was saying this, basically, just give me Jesus. Say it aloud. Just give me Jesus. Hey, the trials are coming, just give me Jesus. The problems are there, just give me Jesus. That's what he was saying. So when they brought these problems to him and they were sharing with him and their apprehensions, he said, just, guys, none of those things are going to move me. I'm going to finish my race with joy. Just give me Jesus. So when they collected all of those offerings from all the different churches, he was accompanied, Paul was accompanied by several leaders from those Gentile churches, and they set sail for Jerusalem. So Paul collected the offerings, several of the leaders from those churches are going to go along to represent those Gentile churches to the Jews in Jerusalem, and let them know we're here, we're, we're, we're real, we have the love of Christ in us just like you. So they set sail for Jerusalem, and here it is. Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, that we came to Kos, the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. Everybody say road trip. Road trip. Right, that's what it sounds like, right? And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload her cargo. So everybody said again, road trip. road trip. So Paul and the guys are now going. They get on a ship and they begin to set sail for Jerusalem. Now, if you read the record, it kind of makes it sound like a series of Greyhound bus stops. You know, pulling up to an old travel center with lukewarm drinks, stale popcorn, and dirty restrooms. You know what I'm saying? It's, everybody say sketchy. Because when you read it, it kind of sounds like that's what you get, the impression you get. It's kind of sketchy. But that is the furthest from the truth. You see, this area that they traveled is the Turkish Riviera, also known as the Turquoise Coast. Those of you that are going with us on the footsteps of Paul tour will see these wonderful sights. All right, so listen. I mean, there along this turquoise coast, the, the waters are crystal, they have crystal clear waters, soft sand beaches, beautiful landscapes, calming breezes. Everybody say, ooh la la. Right? What a road trip. The tranquility and the peace of these places is permeating, but it's temporary. See, this for Paul is as they say, everybody say it, the calm before the storm. The calm before the storm. You know, meteor meteorologists tell us that before most serious storms, that they are preceded by 
a patch of calm, clear weather. The same is true with spiritual storms. Just when it seems like things are good, financially, relationally, physically, spiritually, you know those times, you ever got to that point, you know, where, hey, maybe it's not prosperous, but hey, our bills are paid. <sighs> right? Um, you know, things are good, we have some stuff in the freezer, some, you know, stuff in the shelves. Uh, we're feeling good physically. Uh, maybe we're not uh, great, but I mean, we're feeling good physically. We're, we're feeling good relationally. Things are healthy. Our kids, our, 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 you know, our families, our, our parents, everything is good. And then spiritually, you know, you haven't done better in your whole life. You're, doing, you're having a devotional time. You've been to church more often than you ever had, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's the calm. And then out of nowhere, chaos, confusion, and conflict blow in. The winds blow, the rains pour, and the floods rise. And if you're not, if you're unprepared, it will sweep you down river. The verses that we're going to go through today, there are a lot of historical content. Or a historical account. They don't have a lot of theology. Except for this. During this calm that Paul is going through, we're going to watch what he does in the time period of the calm before the storm. What Paul did in the calm before the storm. Are you ready? Look at your neighbor and say, fasten your seatbelt. Here we go. Let's start reading with verse 4. Let's read the first three words out loud. And finding disciples. So they're in Tyre. They've gone through the turquoise coast. It's a calm. And finding disciples. We stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. So Paul and them are going through this turquoise coast. It's beautiful, it's peaceful, it's tranquil. But it's the calm before the storm. They come to a place in Tyre, in Phoenicia. They, they, they camp out for a few days. And one of the things that we see that Paul did during the calm and the quiet during the calm before the storm, is that Paul stayed plugged in to spiritual things. Everybody say, plugged in. He said, plugged in to spiritual things. You know, when in season of calm, it's easy to get caught up in all the fun in the sun and put spiritual things on the back burner. You know, without a crisis, we tend to cruise. Look at your neighbor and say that out loud. Without a crisis, we tend to cruise. We let things, we let our spiritual lives just kind of go a little bit, drift a little bit. We're not intentionally abandoning God. We just tend to, you know, cruise. Go ahead, do you like that to your neighbor, huh? Yeah. <laughs> During that time, we don't even notice, because we're so distracted, we don't even notice that our spiritual batteries are in the red. And that we are spiritually running out of juice. We don't notice it, because we're distracted. Well, Paul was very conscientious about his spiritual, his spiritual battery. Paul is a lot like some of us when our cell phone is going low. We start looking for a place to plug in, to recharge, to refuel. I mean, we're proactive and motivated. I've seen some of you. When you come in, you're looking at your phone, and then you walk, you walk in, and you're looking around like this. I know what you're looking for. The plug. Look at your neighbor and say, I know he's talking about you right now. We're, we become proactive, right? I see people there, the, you know, in the airports. You run into them, and they're like, you know. And they're looking everywhere. 
They'll unplug other stuff that's important to the airport just to plug in their phone. <laughs> and the reason being is that we don't want to need our phone and then it die. That's why we become proactive. That's why we're motivated. You know, the old adage from the Cowboys used to be, keep your saddle oiled and your gun greased, right? For us, it's keep your phone charged. <laughs> we ought to have the same attitude about our spiritual batteries. See, Paul knew that eventually a storm would hit. So he best be prepared, recharged, equipped, ready. So during the calm before the storm, Paul took the initiative to find, everybody said out loud, what? Fellowship. He looked for disciples. So they were going through this turquoise, you know, um, Riviera, the turquoise coast. They're enjoying, and I'm sure that they walked through the sands. They enjoyed some sun every once in a while. They, they were enjoying themselves, but when I finally got to a place where Paul recognizes his spiritual battery is low and he's got to plug in, so the first time they get to this place where they dot the tire, he starts looking for disciples. He needs fellowship. Say it again, what? Fellowship. Because that's what we should do during the calm of the storm, is find fellowship. You see, church is the place that we refuel, that we re recharge, that we relate. We need to connect with like-minded, like-hearted people because it stimulates faith. It challenges growth. It enhances our walk. In fact, it's the reason Paul said this in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Read it with me. We've read it before. Let's read it together. Let us not neglect our church meetings as some people do, but encourage and challenge each other especially now that the day of his coming back again is drawing near. You guys got that? We need, we need that. It says, let, and I'm preaching to the choir here, but that's why we're here, aren't we? Some of us are going through a trial. We're going through a storm. And man, this is the place where we find strength, where we find support, where we, where we find the Lord, and we, we, we find that, that, that tranquility. But even when we're not going through a storm, we come. Why? Because we're inevitably going to go through a storm, and we want to be full and strong when it hits. Amen. At least I, that's why I'm here. Amen. So Paul knew the church was a place to get ignited, inspired, and encouraged. A place where we encounter the right kind of friends who will strengthen us. You got to give up on those flimsy friends that you've been hanging with. You know, Jack Daniels and Jim Beam and Mary Jane and Margarita and Ashley Madison and Waylon and Willie. Stop hanging on those guys. Those things are about as reliable as a blind crossing guard. Look at your neighbor and say, You're bound for a crash. Look at your neighbor and say, You're bound for a crash. Here in our neck of the woods, we're familiar with aspen trees. And the interesting thing about aspens is that they survive and thrive in community. Everybody said out loud in what? The root systems of aspen trees is intertwined. And that's why they grow in groves. They're intertwined together. Here's what the aspen tree does. The aspen trees serve one another with strength, stability, and sap. Everybody say it, sap. <laughs> yes, every one of those trees pumps through their veins in a continued uh, you, you know, unit. All of those things. Strength, they provide that for each other. Strength, stability, and sap. The sap provides nutrients and minerals and energy and healing to one another. Jesus designed the church to function the same way. So if you ever thought that the church is filled with a bunch of saps, you'd be right. 
And you need them. Look at your neighbor and say, I need you. And look at your neighbor and say, and, and, and you need me. Isn't that right? So let's, let's plug in and get sappy here. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, sappy. We've got to plug in and get sappy, get encouraged, get energized, and get healthy. That's what Paul was doing when he gets off the boat during this calm. One might say, I don't, need to, I don't need to press in. I don't need to be, you know, that faithful. I don't need to really pray hard right now. Things are cool. But he realized that it's important to be prepared. And the place that you get prepared and you stay prepared is right here in community. Another thing the apostle Paul did during the calm before the storm was this. Everybody say it out loud. He was what? Listening for God's word. Say it again. Listening for God's word. I love it. So not only did he plug in to community, but he's also having his ear out because God was speaking. Let's read it. Verse 7. Here's what Paul does. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to uh, Timotheus, uh, greeted the brethren, and stayed them with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from, the place, from that place pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. And then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, we, we ceased and we said, The will of the Lord be done. So, one thing Paul does during the calm of the storm is he plugs in. The next thing he does is he starts listening for God's word. All of them get to this place called Caesarea. Everybody say the name, what? Caesarea. Those of you that were in Israel with us, that traveled to Israel with us, we were there at the beach at Caesarea. I preached, I taught a lesson right there on the beach. It was beautiful. Well, they ended up in Caesarea. Now, what we know here is it tells us that a well-known servant of the Lord lived there in Caesarea by the name of Philip. Now, Philip was one of the seven chosen for ministry back when the church in Jerusalem first started. Peter preached. In the first two sermons that Peter preached, 7,000 people came to Jesus. That's a lot of people. Well, there was 11 of them. You know, disciples. And trying to pastor and help and encourage and teach 7,000 people needs more than 11 guys. There were several people in the church who were falling through the cracks. They were being missed. They, they weren't getting ministered to. So Peter and the guys, John and, and Peter and John, James, they got together and they said, we can't, we, we can't go over there and, and we can't be everywhere. Let's get seven men who fall full of the Holy Spirit that we can put in charge in helping us to minister to the people. Philip was one of those guys. He was one of the guys who was handpicked because the Holy Spirit was upon him. And he had a wonderful ministry and ability to connect with people. And so he was picked. Not only did Philip do that, but Philip eventually, some, you know, in the midst of that, ended up taking the gospel to Samaria, outside of Jerusalem. That was a first-time thing. He shared the gospel with the Samaritans. And a big revival occurred. Thousands of them came to Jesus Christ there in Samaria. And Paul was a preacher who did it. Excuse me. Philip was a preacher who did it. Isn't that awesome? But even more impressive than that is what's listed. He raised four girls to be godly servants of the Lord just like him. That's even more impressive. 
Four godly girls he raised who shared the gospel with everybody around them. They were full of the Lord. It was, it was, it's impressive. Listen, guys. The biggest and most important mission field is at home. I'm going to say it again. The biggest and most important mission field is at home. Raising our kids to love and serve the Lord. Because if we don't teach our children and grandchildren to follow Christ, the world will teach them not to. And that's why, from the very beginning, God urged us to teach and to model and to invest in our children's spiritual lives. Here's the verses, Deuteronomy chapter 11. Read them with me. So commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine, God said. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that as long as the sky remains above the earth, you and your children may flourish. Teach it to them. Go ahead and nudge somebody next to you and tell them, teach it to them. Model for them. Invest in them. Paul echoed God's uh, you know, uh, challenge in Ephesians chapter 6. Here's what he told us. Read with, read, read with me. Fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. Give Philip a hand for getting it done, man. So Philip and the guys... They get off the bus, excuse me, off the ship. They get off the ship. The first thing, the, the batteries are low. They want to recharge. And so they recharge with, with some family, because that's what you do during the time of you know, calm. And then the next thing he does is he goes over to Philip's house. And Philip's got this beautiful place out on the beach on the coast. And then there's this guy, Agabus. Everybody said what? Agabus. This guy, Agabus, is a preacher. He comes down from Judea to Philip's house probably on a weekly basis, at least once a week. Reason being to give Bible studies there. Because in Philip's house, Philip is a preacher. So they probably have, he's opened his home to believers who are coming and hearing the gospel and getting discipled and growing in grace, just like you guys. So Agabus gets there. So Agabus gets there, and guys, one of the things about, uh, you know, all the people there at Philip's house and all the Christians from there at Caesarea that came, they loved Agabus because they were visual learners. How many of you are visual learners? You know, you like to see pictures, you like to see illustrations, you like to hear the stories, right? Because it puts it together. Look at your neighbor and say, like that. Let me see the show of hands again. Let me see. No wonder I worked so hard to do that. So, so glad. So Agabus, everybody likes Agabus because, you know, he, he comes down once a week and he really shares that with the people. Agabus um, was loved because for that very reason. Now, as Agabus got up and started addressing, you know, the people at Philip's house, he, you know, he used props and stories and examples. And as he's, he's go, you know, going through the motions, um, you know, Paul is in the audience, and, and he goes over to Paul as he's teaching. He says, hey, listen, Paul, lend me your belt. And so Paul, you know, takes off his belt because Agabus, you know, he's Agabus, that kind of teacher, and he gets his belt, and you can see Agabus talking to folks and carrying this belt. And then all of a sudden, Agabus starts tying his hands up and then getting down on the floor and tying his legs up all together and tying himself up. And the whole audience is captivated. What is he going to, where is this going? Where is he going to go with this? He's got their attention. They're on the edge of their seats. And then he says, he drives his point, and he says, the man whose belt this is, is going to be bound when he gets to Jerusalem by the Roman authorities. Everybody say, wow. They all got it. Every time I teach, I strive to be to captivate your attention and then hit you with a personal application. Don't you guys enjoy that? Huh? 
I hit you with a prayer of how it applies to you. I pull you in with a story, with a little humor, with a little bit of information. I pull you in, and then, oh, I challenge you. Look at your neighbor and say, ouch. But you, you don't even care. It felt good. You laughed while you got it, right? That's exactly what Agabus did. He taught the lesson, and then he hit it with a personal application. Right down Paul's alley. It spoke to him. Like when I do it. You hear it, you get encouraged. You, you, you hear it, you get convicted. You, you hear it, 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 it grabs you, it challenges you. But for one thing is certain, you clearly hear from God and are, everybody say this word, equipped. How many of you can say amen to that, right? Yeah. You smiled, you laughed, you hurt, but I got it. Look at your neighbor and say, get sappy. Just look at your neighbor and tell him, right? We know what it means. Well, Paul did that to Agabus. Paul was equipped. He was prepared for what was happening or what was going to happen. And the same is true here. We come to church and the sermon helps us, it prepares us for what we might be going through at the moment. And some of us are here because we're like, oh, God, I need to hear from God today. And some of us are like, well, I don't, I don't really have, I'm not going through anything right now. I just, you know, just here. What that's doing is it's preparing you and strengthening you and charging your battery because you know what? Something is going to happen. Right? It's going to happen. So always remember, sometimes sermons are to bolster you through what's currently happening in your life. And sometimes sermons are to brace you for what's on the way. God is speaking. So listen up. Everybody say it out loud. What? In fact, poke the person in front of you and say, listen up. You know, there's a story of an evil witch that cast a spell on a handsome prince. The spell was that he could only speak one word per year. However, if he didn't speak the word, he could have rollover minutes. He could have a rollover if he didn't speak the word. The prince had fallen madly in love with a beautiful princess. Who would, she'd come by and visit him and sit in silence with him. They would hold hands. They went for long walks. They kissed passionately. He waited for two years so he could say, my darling. But then, right before the, the time came, he thought that that just wasn't enough. He also wanted to tell her that he loved her. And so he waited for three more years to save up the words. On the fifth year, when he was just about to talk, to say, my darling, I love you. Then he thought how faithful she had been. And it wouldn't be right if he didn't ask her to marry him. So he waited in silence for four more years. On the ninth year of silence, he escorted her to the most beautiful rose garden. He knelt before her, and with his husky voice, he said, My darling, I love you. Will you marry me? The beautiful princess smiled. She tucked her hair behind her ear, and she said, Pardon? <laughs> Listen up! <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, listen up. <laughs> Don't miss the message. <laughs> During the calm before the storm, Paul kept up with spiritual life. That's the lesson we hear. St Paul stayed plugged in to fellowship and godly friends. And he let God's word equip him for what was ahead. Paul's storm was looming. He was in Caesarea. It's about 40 miles to Jerusalem. That storm is descending and will hit in Jerusalem. 
but because Paul, what Paul did during the calm, by recharging, by reinforcing, by connecting and standing with others, Paul was able to say, when they told him, it's going to happen, something bad's going to happen, Paul was able to say, if they pull the trigger, I go to heaven. And if they don't, I'm going to preach. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Let's close with the, by quoting the verse one more time. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Let's say it out loud. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Say it again. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Here's another way to say it. Just give me Jesus. Everybody say it out loud. Just give me Jesus. Listen, if you're here this morning and you haven't surrendered your life completely to Christ, this is the perfect day to do it. His arms are wide open. The grace door is still available. And he's still saying, come. Don't put it off. Take advantage of it. He wants to forgive your sins, cleanse you of all shame, all feelings of guilt. He wants to give you a new start. And all you have to do is just say yes. If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand? We'll pray together. Beautiful. Let's stand so we can pray together. I'll lie together, Father. I know I'm a sinner. And I need forgiveness. I have run from you. I have fought you. But today I surrender. I repent for my sin. And I turn to you. Wash me clean. Make me new. I commit myself to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or you're rededicating your life, There'll be some leaders standing up here in a minute. They have some Bibles and materials they'd love to share with you. Come up and after this closing song and just say, hey, listen, um, I prayed with Pastor Dion and uh, I gave my heart to Jesus. They will welcome you and encourage you and plug you in. You just got plugged into the root system, man. They're going to be all sappy, I promise. <laughs> listen. For those of you that are going through a storm right now, you know, sometimes we say, tis the season. It's not always to be jolly. There are a lot of people, tis the season to be stressed. Tis the season to be disappointed. Because there's all kinds of storms out there, financially, relationally, families that don't talk, that don't connect, issues that go on. Sometimes, if you're going through a storm like that, you need to do what Paul said. Just plug in. So if you're needing prayer, you just want somebody to pray with you, it's a good idea. I encourage it. To step out of your seat at the close of this song, come on up here, pray with these guys. I tell you, they're full of sap. They have what you need through the power of the Holy Spirit. They'll pray with you. And you'll watch God answer prayers. So take advantage of that. For those of you that are going through a calm season right now, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you've made this a regular routine because we need to be strong and stay full. I encourage you to keep going. Be prepared. You're going to go through a thing or two. But when you're full of the Holy Spirit and the Lord, it's a lot easier. Because Jesus said, if you build your house, if you anchor your house by listening to my word, he said, when the rains fall and the floods rise, your house will stay planted. But if you don't, it'll get washed away like, the sand, like being planted on the sand. So stay filled. Continue to grow in grace. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to smile on you this week. 
be gracious to you and give you peace. May the beauty